Good day and welcome to this special edition of Inside Fall River. I'm Steve Kamara and I host today at really a great institution that's evolving here in Fall River, the Children's Museum of Fall River, located here at 441 North Main Street. Is yes. that the right address? Yes. And uh, right here at the corner of North Main and Walnut Street. And I'm pleased to have as uh, my special guest at this uh, special edition, Joanne Sprager, who is a name known in town, and she's uh, executive director and really a f the founder, the mother, if you will, of, uh, of this great institution. Welcome, Joanne. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for that kind introduction. And uh, Joanne, um, you know, we've watched with great anticipation. Uh, the community has been watching this uh, institute uh, become what it is. And I thought that we might begin with just going back in time to when the germ was Certainly. first planted sure, and that sure, uh, sure. you first thought of, uh, sure, 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 of sure. creating this uh, sure, sure. entity. Well, I can't take all the credit in that way. Um, the, uh, it really has to go to Ray Gordon. Uh, who was our first executive director um, and the founder of the Museum Without Walls. Uh, in 1999 was when Ray first started ringing doorbells and going out to the local businesses and looking for the interest and actually formed the board of directors. Uh, from there, uh, they got the nonprofit status and uh, the logo uh, before I came on board a few years later. Um, we called ourselves, as I said, the Museum Without Walls, and we went out looking for partners. Um, some of them to name would be BCC, of course, uh, the, children, the uh, Boys and Girls Club, uh, the Narrows um, were some of the um, institutions and venues locally uh, that allowed us, if you will, uh, to partner and do some of the grant writing that we wrote at that time. Mm -hmm. So here we are 14 years later yes. and uh, the, uh, we now have walls. It's yes, no longer yes. a museum without walls. Yes. And uh, what is the mission of uh, the Children's uh, Museum? Well, the Children's Museum's uh, mission is uh, to bring, to provide uh, educational opportunities for children um, through play. Uh, one of our taglines is explore, discover, grow. Um, and that's an invitation for all children to come um, and explore now in this wonderful uh, venue, um, discover and grow. Um, it's family oriented, it's their self-guided tours um, with emphasizing that, that the family or caregivers uh, play a role um, in playing with the children. So what are, just to focus on those three words which are so important, what are some of the things that the children explore and what sure. do they discover and how do they grow? Sure, sure. Uh, well, some examples would be, uh, for instance, uh, the wonderful dinosaur room uh, is one of our uh, signature rooms uh, presently. Um, and the children get a chance to explore, to become paleontologists, if you will. Uh, there are opportunities uh, for them to uh, dig for bones, uh, you know, kind of thing. Um, and then there are lots of resources in the room with books and puzzles and so forth that then um, they can learn about the bone that they found and actually find it in a book and learn more about that dinosaur. So, you know, that's, that's one area. Um, there are a lot of open-ended kind of things, too. We always provide, in addition to the rooms, uh, there are hallway exhibits, and then there are always um, different art mediums and, and things out that are maybe seasonal. Um, so the children right now, for instance, uh, there's a craft in the hallway to do with fish, and there is an exhibit that will build throughout the summer about you know the ocean and, and what's offered in, in this way. So there are always ways for them to connect to nature and to connect to you know the seasons of New England. And in addition to the dinosaur room, are there other specialty rooms? There are. Um, you know, each one you know has its its own you know special quality. But in particular, uh, Violet's room, I would say, would be another room that we're very very fond of. Um, that uh, is actually a children's book called Violet's Music, and we obtained the copyright. Uh, from the author and the illustrator um, and brought the book to life. And uh, a BCC art class under the direction of Marissa Millard uh, took that book 
and submitted drawings and uh, we actually were involved uh, with helping them through that process and they actually received a college grade. So uh, that was a great learning opportunity. Um, as well as the Dinosaur Room under the direction of Eric Durant was also a BCC project. Mm -hmm. And I understand there's a water room? The water room is the newest room and uh, one far, fun part of um, the, uh, the room itself, uh, we had a fundraiser uh, paint a tile and we, we sold tiles for $10 a piece and uh, as a fundraiser for the room and uh, it was a wonderful fundraiser. Uh, we sold nearly 500 tiles and uh, so families are really enjoying to go into the room and, and find their tile on the wall. It's a real sensory, uh, hands-on, uh, people incorporated, uh, uh, provided the funds to buy some of the tables. Um, and we're pleased to say that all our exhibits are handicap accessible, but particularly that one um, to um, have some equipment in there. One of the tables is, is wheelchair accessible. Um, and we, uh, through a donation from early intervention, uh, we actually have something called a switch that is a, a piece of equipment that can be put on one of the tables if a child doesn't have much motor ability uh, uh -huh. in their hands. You just press on a button and the water wheel goes and it's, it's you know, able. So it's, it's wonderful. We've had, we had a birthday party uh, this weekend and a young boy in a wheelchair uh, was his second time back and uh, it was wonderful to be able to see. <laughs> Well, that's great. You mentioned People Incorporated as a contributor, and there are certainly others that are uh, allowing you to sustain this Absolutely. major effort. So who are some of the key contributors, and how, how has it come to be that you've received the sure. financial resources necessary to keep going? Yes. Well, in, in many ways, it's been a grassroots, um, like the tiles, for instance, a $10 tile, uh, you know, and it turns into a $5,000 donation. Uh, some of the larger corporations uh, that have come forward thus far, uh, Bay Coast Bank uh, is a major sponsor of ours. Uh, they have sponsored the Dinosaur Room. Uh, Bank Five, major sponsor, has sponsored the Lego Room. Um, we've had um, the Lund family uh, had a race uh, uh, last summer. They, they choose a charity every year, and we were the charity uh, last summer uh, for um, the uh, cigarette boat race right, that. Um, and uh, that was a fun day we got to participate in that um, and uh, many uh, we have fundraisers um, we just had a very successful spring fling um, and then um, we do our hundred dollar um, raffle uh, at Christmas um, and um, that uh, we were able to raise uh, probably six eight thousand dollars from from that event um, so we go on and on um, and we're right now we're looking to more businesses um, to sponsor the rooms to pay ourselves back if you will for uh, the funds that have been put out and it's not totally accidental that you're in this space uh so there's a little bit of government connection, at least as, as it relates to this building, correct? Yes, yes, uh, it is. Uh, we, uh, we had been looking at one of the schools for a number of years. Uh, over a three-year period, uh, we had uh, petitioned uh, for the Highland School. And uh, in the meantime, uh, this building became available. And uh, we saw just a little article in the paper saying that they had set a criteria and uh, it was a nonprofit, uh, someone that would take over the whole building. Uh, the commissioners didn't want to be landlord to 10 different entities. Uh, and I saw it and I said, oh, can you imagine if we could get that building? But how on earth can we get that building if we can't get an abandoned school? And uh, our friend, uh, former Senator Menard, uh, was instrumental in uh, connecting me with uh, Commissioner John Mitchell. And uh, we set up a meeting and once we met with John, um, he immediately uh, set up a meeting with Paul Kitchen and Maria Lopes, the other two commissioners. And we began um, working out a contract. Um, and within four months time, uh, we were occupying this building. and. Uh, 
So it was, uh, uh, you know, tremendous um, for us to be able to be in such an in inviting, uh, wonderful building. Uh, the county did a wonderful job in maintaining their building. So the good thing about this building was there was very little for us to do. To, it was up to code. Um, and that was a, a big plus for us. So we were beginning to take our funds and immediately begin on exhibits. We didn't have any environmental issues. Excellent. Well, it is a great building. It does look like a castle on the it hill uh, here in our center city. And um, when can people come to visit the museum? Right now, we're open on a regular basis five days a week, Wednesday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m on Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. and on Sundays 12 to 4 p.m. Um, you can book field trips. We have uh, with us this morning, a, a preschool with us this morning. Uh, we've booked you know, field trips for public, private. Summer programs uh, are coming in and, and we're booking up already uh, through the summer. And birthday parties and uh, other events we have. Uh, some uh, larger groups that will hold monthly meetings here. So we're open to, um, you know, uh, any ways to showcase our, our building. So for instance, uh, a group like the Rotary may look to once a year have their meeting here, their weekly or monthly meeting. It's a chance for us to showcase the building um, is just one example. Well, as we uh, wrap up our uh, brief interview today, and it's all, it all goes by so fast, and we certainly want to come back again uh, to do a more in-depth in yes. uh, focus. But I do want to ask you about the um, vision for the future, and, and, and I'm sure you have a board of directors that governs you as you proceed to that future. I do. Yes, we do. We, uh, we have a wonderful board of directors uh, under the direction of uh, Marissa Cardelli is our board uh, president. Um, we now have a staff. We're a staff of three. I'm proud to say that uh, I, I have uh, uh, two staff members in addition to myself. Uh, we have a, an active board of about 18. Um, we have completed phase one. We call the first floor as the completion of phase one. So we had grand opening um, celebration in May. Mm -hmm. um, we plan on uh, going to the second floor and one of the wings on the third floor, um, as well as a cafe in the basement uh, is what we're looking at for our next project. Now, if people want more information, uh, how can they contact you? Both they can contact telephone us. Telephone number yes, or website? Yes, 508-672-0033 is the phone number. The web, cmgfr.org, uh, you can contact us. And we're also on Facebook. You can befriend us on Facebook as well. Well, that's great. And um, again, this has been a special edition, uh, an on-site edition uh, here at the Children's Museum of uh, Fall River or Greater, Greater Fall, Fall River? River? Children's Museum of Greater Fall River. And uh, it certainly is a treasure for our city. And uh, thank you for joining us here for this special edition of Inside Fall River. And thank you, Joanne, for your time today. My pleasure, Steve. Wendy Garf Lip from United Neighbors, and this is a special edition of Inside Fall River. Today with me is Leanne Wilbur, who is the manager, proprietor, and curator of the Lizzie Borden Bed and Breakfast Museum. Welcome, Leanne. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. So tell us a little bit about the history of this place and the Lizzie Borden story, of course. Well, uh, the house itself is now a bed and breakfast and museum. It opened to the public in, on August 4th. 1996 when the former owner Martha McGinn and her partner Ron Evans decided to open it to the public after uh, being private residents for so many years. My partner Donald and I bought it in June of 2004 and we've continued to run it as a B&B &B and a museum to the public and uh, continue to uh, spread the word of Lizzie and the history of Fall River to as many tourists as possible. So give us a snapshot picture of what the story is of Lizzie Borden. Not everybody is familiar with it. Well, uh, here in the house on the morning of August 4th, 1892, 
the bodies of Andrew Jackson Borden and his second wife, Abby Durfee Gray Borden, were found brutally murdered. The only person ever brought to trial and the only suspect in the case was Mr. Borden's then 32-year-old daughter, Lizzie. And this year is the 121st anniversary of the murders and the 120th year celebration of her acquittal. Uh, Lizzie was brought to trial. Her uh, trial was held in the, Bed in the Bedford Superior Courthouse. It lasted 13 days. And uh, after less than an hour, a all-male jury found Lizzie not guilty on all charges. And to this day, the murder is still unsolved. Mm. And do you think that if it was nowadays with DNA evidence and things like that, that Lizzie would have been tried and acquitted? Or would she have been found guilty? <laughs> That's hard to say. Mm -hmm. uh, but with today's technology, I, I think um, the guilty party, let's say, would definitely have been brought to just justice. And were there any other potential suspects? No, no, there were not. Uh, there, a few people were looked at, the usual, usual suspects, you might say, but uh, no one was ever, ever charged with the crime. Mm -hmm. So when this place became a museum, I imagine that there's some mission to the museum. So you want to tell us a little bit about what your mission is and what the commitment is to the community here? What's the reason why you have a museum here? Our uh, commitment to the community is to continue to keep the house open and let people come and decide for themselves, for one. We give them the facts of the case and let them decide. Uh, also to visit a historical home that really hasn't changed in 121 years, aside from the modern conveniences of electricity and indoor plumbing, which Lizzie did not have, the house itself is relatively unchanged after all these years. So you're literally walking into a near-perfect crime scene. Mm -hmm. So how many people do you get coming through here during the course of, we'll say, a summer or a few months or anything? Our, uh, our numbers are anywhere between our day tours and overnight stays between um, 20 and 25,000 people. So what is the vibe? Most people think she did it or she didn't do it. What do you hear? Uh, it seems to still be split down the middle. Lizzie still has her supporters who say she couldn't have possibly committed the crime. And then there are people who come in and with, with the idea that she couldn't have committed, committed it, but by the end of the tour they're going, yeah, yeah, she's guilty. <laughs> well, that's pretty cool. So uh, tell me, what supports this place? Fundraising, contributions, the bed and breakfast? How do you keep this place up and running? Uh, Lack of sleep this time of year. Uh, I have a great, great uh, crew who works for me. I have, at any given time, 15 to 20 employees who uh, work all year long for me. They work at all different times. I have one employee who actually lives in Arizona, as a, and he's a school teacher. And he just came back to visit his family for the summer, and he's working on Fridays for me. So I'm, and I have people who work three or four days a week for me. Uh, so it's my employees who help me keep the place running and keep me on this side of sane. But uh, our support and is all uh, is all between the tours, our gift shop, and the B and B. We do not get outside donations. Um, we're a public business, uh, privately owned, so. We do not get any support from the state or the city. Mm -hmm. And do you take private donations, though? Uh, we've never had mon monetary donations. If somebody has donated something to the house, it is maybe a lamp mm -hmm. for the house, uh, something to replace something that I had broken. And um, you know, I, I had someone uh, who had some antique picture frames that they found in their great grandmother's attic, and they gave them to us. Nice. So. Donations such as that, but um, as far as monetary, no one's, no one's uh, given us anything that great. Yet. And uh, can people volunteer here at the museum? Do you have volunteer opportunities or employment opportunities here? Uh, well, we all of our employees are employed. Uh, we don't have any volunteers, mm. surprisingly enough. Uh, everyone's on a payroll. Nice.
and I do hire new tour guides every year. We have a few who are here just for the summer, uh, between for college, and I have a couple of school teachers who work for me. So every year I see uh, I do hire one or two new employees. Great. And what are the hours of operation here? Uh, the day tours of the house are given from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. on the hour daily. Uh, last tour is always at 3. Our gift shop opens at 10.30 every morning and usually is open till 5 o'clock in the evening. Mm -hmm. uh, when we have guests, our guests start checking in anytime after 4 p.m. And checkout time is between 10 and 10.30 the next day. Uh, if you do stay overnight, you get an evening tour of the house, which can last anywhere from an hour and a half to two hours, and full breakfast in the morning. Mm -hmm. So if you do manage to spend, spend it, uh, get through the night, we do feed you very well. If you do manage to get through the night? I lost a the other night. <laughs> you're hinting at something going on at night here. <laughs> I think the, other guest, the guests the other night scared themselves. Uh, they were actually in this room here looking through some photographs they had taken and had brought some EVP meters with them and had them set up on the table. Okay, let's stop a minute. What's an EVP meter for those that might not know? Uh, EVP P meter is electric voice, uh, electric, electric voice phenomenon, and uh, they had a couple of the meters set up on the table, and as the daughter, it was a mother and a daughter, and as she's going through her photographs and noticing some odd things in the photographs, they said all the meters started going off. As if there was a presence in the room. Yes, mm -hmm. and uh, she looked at her mother and said, we, we can leave now. <laughs> and her mother said, our bags are upstairs. And her, the daughter said, we don't need our bags. And she's like, yes, we do. <laughs> so, so but I take it they made it through the net. No, no, they took off. Oh, they did? Yes. Mm, interesting. Interesting. And so they did come back for breakfast, though. Oh, OK. So <laughs> that's good. <laughs> so that's good. Do you have people that come and feel that there's a presence here and no, things no. like that? Mm -hmm. Has there been any testing or any other than those EVP meters that you spoke about? Uh, we've had groups come through the house, and we have them come through many times a year. Uh, you know, independent groups, TV shows come through with their with their equipment, and I I I have to giggle at them sometimes anyway because I've lived here for nine years. I know they're here. I don't need a meter to tell me there's something in the house. Uh, what do you think's in the house? Uh, well, uh, I do really believe that Mr. Borden is still here. I, I usually joke that you know if he paid a lot of money for the house, he's not leaving until he get his money's he gets every penny's worth out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I really do believe it's Mr. Borden. Uh, we've had some photographs taken in the past couple of years where we think Mrs. Borden was captured in them uh, because they're very very interesting photographs of a woman and um, so not being a professional in the uh, that area but uh, living with them long enough I have to say Mr. and Mrs. Borden. Mm -hmm. And Lizzie? No, I don't I don't think Lizzie's here she hated this house mm -hmm. if she's anywhere she's probably up at Maplecroft having a good old time. So tell me did she do it? What do you think? Oh, yeah, she did it. No doubt in your mind? No. no doubt. So if people want to stay here, how do they make reservations, and how many people can uh, be accommodated here at one time? Well, uh, if someone is interested in renting an evening with us, we now have it set up on our um, online on our website at www.lizzie-borden.com. Okay, let's at say that again, www.lizzie-borden.com. Mm -hmm. We have it set up that they can rent a room right through our website now. Uh, if they have any questions about it, they can always call Mia here at the house. The number is 508-675-7333. Say it one more time, 508-675-7333. Uh, our rooms for overnight stays are based on double occupancy. Third floor rooms are 200 for the evening plus tax. Second floor runs 225 to 250 for the night. And as I said earlier, evening tour of the house and breakfast is included with all overnight stays. And uh, we also do operate as a museum during the day between the hours of 11 and 3. First tours at 11, tours around the hour, last tours always at 3. 
And is there a charge for the tour? Uh, tours for adults are $15. Uh, seniors are twelve fifty, and children aged seven to fifteen are eight dollars. And how many people can stay at one time? How much accommodation do you have? Maximum in the house for an overnight stay is eighteen, Great. and whole house rental is fifteen hundred for the night. Uh, we've rented out, out several times two single groups for birthday parties, anniversary parties, and believe it or not, family reunions. Hmm. I'm not sure I'd want to have a family reunion, but uh, I am very much taken with all the different period pieces that you have here. Are they all from the Borden's home or some things replicas? Where did all these wonderful furnishings and things come from? Uh, m most of them are antique pieces. Uh, some are reproductions. The house, was, the, the house was put together, the crime scenes anyway, using the crime scene photos, so those are as close as possible and the furniture was matched to be close as possible. This room here, the front parlor, we guessed at. Uh, the front parlor pretty much looks like my, my great grandmother's living room at the moment. So I just went with what I knew a historical mm. home looked like. And I noticed you have lots of books of photographs and there's photographs of all the players on the wall. Oh, yes. So it, it is quite the experience. And I imagine that all your staff is conversant with the story and are able to take questions from people. Yes, our staff is well versed with the crime itself and the history of Fall River. Well, I would invite you to come to the Lizzie Borden Bed and Breakfast Museum and decide for yourself. We saw the couch where Mr. Borden was found and we looked at the crime scene photos and compared it to the room we were in. It's a little scary, it's a little frightening, but it's also very, very interesting. So come make your own decision. Stop by the museum, come see Leanne, and see the richness that this museum brings to Fall River. I'm Wendy Garflip, and this is Inside Fall River.